Welcome to Crime Bites, the show where we talk about some truly bizarre and disturbing crime cases. My name is Liz and today is True Crime Tuesday. Have you ever met someone that for whatever reason your interactions with them sent you on a wild investigation about demons? How many of you guys believe in demons, first of all, or demonic possession? I don't usually do a lot with paranormal, and demons are a topic that I am fascinated and quite honestly petrified of. But before we get into today's story, let's pause for a quick promotion. We're doing just strong today because, well, frankly, I might need this hoodie to talk about today's topic. I'm strong, but... Shoot, some things creep me out a bit too much, like demons, for example. And this is my favorite hoodie to throw on when I need to remind myself that I am just strong. So yeah, it's a little thing sometimes, but it is extremely comfortable and you can grab one or maybe one with some color at juststrong.com. And if you use this coupon code at checkout, they'll give you 10% off your first order. Let's stay just strong. And with that, let's get back to today's story. In 1973, The Exorcist was released and was instantly surrounded by mixed reviews and controversy. The movie itself took twice as long to shoot as was originally planned with cast and crew members being injured and even dying in unusual accidents. Then when it was finally released, the notions about the film being cursed grew when viewers would faint or vomit when seeing the more disturbing scenes. It ended up grossing $193 million by the end of its theatrical one, which was so much in 1973, and is still regarded as one of the highest grossing horror films of all time, and is what most people think about when we talk about demons. There have been a bunch of exorcist or exorcism movies that have come out since then, all typically involving a person or people who get possessed by demons and then ultimately their exorcism. In 2005, one such movie appeared, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. This is the last one that I've watched and I'm not huge into these movies. I'm, I kind of have to be in the right mood and I really have no idea what or how to describe what that is, but I'm like, okay, let's see. <laughs> and this time I threw this one on when pondering demons or demonic possession again, like, okay, what's going on here? It was definitely a chilling watch. But what makes this movie even more interesting is that it follows the true story about a young lady who in France was exercised 67 times. Her real name was Annalise Michael and she ended up dying and both the priests who performed the exorcisms as well as her parents were charged with negligent homicide. But did they kill her? Did demons kill her? or did she kill herself? Today we are going to explore her story and go ahead and grab a coffee or hot cocoa if it's later because this one's gonna be a little bit longer and bigger bite, if you will. And let's go ahead and start by talking about demonic possession for a quick second. Demons or spirits are found in a variety of religions across the world including Catholicism, Buddhism, Voodoo, Hinduism, Wicca, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, and many of the native African and American religions, I'm sure others that I'm not mentioning. So globally, they're a thing, collectively, many of us believe in. In fact, in the United States, we are split right down the middle on demons. And most of these religions believe either voluntarily or involuntarily that these demons or spirits have the ability to possess people. I find a concept has more weight when it has some sort of version across different cultures and religions and demons definitely do. But do they actually exist? Or are they some concept that we all kind of collectively created to help us kind of define our existence. Let's go ahead and jump into today's story. Annalise Michael was born to Joseph and Anna McCall on September 21st of 1962. And forgive me because Leifabulfig, 
Leipzig in Bavaria in Western Germany. Her family was very Catholic. She would have an older sister named Martha who would die at the age of eight from kidney failure. She would also have three younger sisters who were basically best friends to her. Her father actually wanted to be a Catholic priest but had struggled with his Latin and so he would end up joining the army instead when World War II broke out. He had three sisters though who did go on to be nuns, so very religious family. The whole town was a very Catholic town. Now as Annalise was growing up, she got sick a lot. She had measles, mumps, scarlet fever before she was even five years old. And ever since she was a little girl, she wanted to be a school teacher and her mother, Anna, encouraged it, telling her that she was destined for college. I like that so much because it kind of makes me think of my mother and grandmother who would have been taking similar paths over here on the States. They were both teachers and along the same timeline too, so that's kind of cool. Anyhow. Annalise would attend a gymnasium, which is a secondary school in Germany, and she was a natural in Latin. Her classmates would describe her as jolly and sweet. And then in 1968, near the end of September, right around before she turned 16, she was sitting in class next to a friend named Marie, and she completely blacked out. Marie would kind of shake her until she woke up, and they would brush it off. But that night around midnight, she woke up with this intense pressure on her stomach. And when she would call out, she realized she couldn't speak and she had wet the bed. Her clock would change from 12, 14 to 15 and automatically the pressure would release and she would be terrified. Wouldn't you be? It sounds like those sleep paralysis stories right there to me, and I've never experienced anything like that, but I've listened to a lot of stories about people who have. Sounds beyond horrifying. So she would clean up and wait till the morning to talk to her mother about it, and it ended up seeming like an isolated incident until next August when it would reoccur. They would go to see a neurologist after the second episode who would believe that Annalise was experiencing grand mal seizures, but didn't prescribe her anything yet because she only had had two at this point and her EEG appeared to be normal. She would return to school, but in the fall would end up contracting multiple illnesses from tuberculosis to pneumonia. All of these illnesses would leave her bedridden by Christmas and she was admitted to a hospital by February and when she didn't show any improvement, she was transferred to a sanitarium. While she was there on June 3rd of 1970, she was struck with that sleep paralysis type incident again and she was able to scream this time before her tongue froze and the nurses would run in and she would be limp and soiled when she was removed from her bed. They bathed her, her sheets were changed and she went back to bed. Then a few days later she was sitting by her window and she kind of fell into a trance and saw all these colors. And while this was happening, her friends would say that her hands were like clenching and they appeared to almost turn into animal paws. And then her eyes would turn black. She thought it was a vision while she was looking out of her window and play, playing around with her rosary. And she thought it must have been the Virgin Mary letting her know that help was on the way for her. And it comforted her. She would see Wolfgang von Holler, a neurologist on June 16th of 1970, who performed another EEG, and this EEG would show some irregularities, which led the doctor to believe that she had epilepsy, and he would prescribe her an anticonvulsant. There are many different types of epilepsy, and it is fairly common. It's basically a disorder that gives a person recurring seizures. Symptoms do vary, as there are many different types of seizures as well as epilepsy and having a seizure does not mean that you have epilepsy. Epilepsy can be caused by many things such as injuries before, shortly after birth, brain factors or injuries, genetics, and infections. So all of these sicknesses she had as a child could have definitely brought on this epilepsy. Visual hallucinations can 
occur in patients with epilepsy. So remember that. Dr. Von Holler would then send her to a clinic in Kenton where he worked and she would stay there for six weeks. She was trying to kind of relive that night where she had the vision and she would pray every night. And one night the energy kind of shifted and she would say that she saw a dark, sneering, cruel place and she knew it was evil. And it made her afraid to keep praying, which at the moment was one of the only things that was keeping her going. And now every time that she would try to pray, this evil face would return. And it's important to note that the doctors treating her at this clinic believe that these physicians were brought on by her epilepsy. They were kind of the inset of psychosis. On August 11th of 1970, she would have another normal EEG and this would allow her to return back home. Her sisters would notice that she was a bit moodier than she was before and she would start to smell this smell that she would describe as burning feces whenever she had her visions. When she returned to school in 1970, she was two years behind. And her friend Maria would note that she had changed and she kind of withdrew from all of her friends. People would say that she only wanted to talk about religion and lost interest in everything else. She would continue visiting various doctors who until lately referred her back to the neurologist. But then in June of 1972, she would have a severe seizure and a few more that summer that were less severe and then they would just suddenly stop. She went back to school and in October, she would start having these issues where she was tensing up while she was awake, similar to the sleep paralysis, but now it was happening while she was awake and the horrible smell and the demon's faces would come along with it. Then in June, she would have yet another normal EEG. In spring of 1973, she would start hearing these strange sounds, but it is said that her three sisters would start hearing these sounds as well. They were kind of like thumping noises. At this point, her parents started getting concerned that the issue at hand was more of a spiritual one. One day her mother would come into the living room and would claim that her face was contorted, staring at a statue of the Virgin Mary. Her hands were contorting into almost animal paws, again with that comparison, and her eyes had gone black just like her friends had observed. While this was going on, she would get rubella. She would see the demons or evil faces even more while she was sick with the rubella. And in spite of this, she would still go on and pass all the courses that she needed to get into a university to become a teacher. But before that would happen, she would make an interesting pilgrimage. Sam Damiano is a small Italian village. It is the hometown to a father who was ultimately sainted named Father Pio. And he was a father who would claim to have experienced religious ecstasy and visions. And he grew up experiencing various illnesses just like Annalise had. He had fainting spells and headaches and his followers would think that he became possessed. When he would pray, he would just stop suddenly like he was vacant. One colleague would claim to witness him levitating. He would claim to experience stigmata. So similar stuff to what we are seeing or what we will be seeing in the future with Annalise. So that summer, Annalise would join a group from her church on a pilgrimage to San Damiano. Annalise was unable to enter the shrine that they were visiting, saying that the soil burned like fire. Saint's pictures would sparkle so intensely that she couldn't look at them. Joseph would buy her a metal to wear and it burned her skin even through her clothes. She also couldn't drink from the scared water and she would say that it smelled terrible. On the way back home, she accosted a woman on the bus and she would say that while it was happening, it was like she was watching it kind of from like a hole inside of herself and she would lower her voice and or a male's raspy low voice would come out of her and she would just go off on this lady who, I mean, would stop saying that she was full of demons. So, but she would attack her and rip the metal that the lady was wearing 
through her dress and then claim that the whole time she was kind of just like watching this attack happen from within herself but couldn't do anything to stop it. The woman, Thea Hein, was kind of one of those nosy church elders that, I mean, if you know, you know, but she would be a driving force in Annalise's exorcisms. That fall, she was supposed to start college, but she was exhausted and overwhelmed. She knew that with how distracted she was by these phases and visions that were just plaguing her, that she wouldn't be able to do well in school. Her mother was so confused and sad about this, and they all kind of wished they could do something, anything, to help get Annalise's life back on track. So on September 3rd of 1974, she would go back to one of her doctors, Dr. Luthy, and this time she would talk to him about the faces that she was seeing and the horrible smells that accompanied them, and she would also say that she knew that the devil was inside of her. Dr. Luthy would later deny this, but the family would claim that he would tell them that there is nothing that he could do for them at this point and that maybe they should seek out a priest. He would claim that his next course of action would always be to refer someone that he could not help to a clinic and not to a priest. So who knows? He may have said it because she was talking about having the devil inside of her when there was nothing that he could do, but he did prescribe her an antipsychotic. So she would go off to college, but instead of getting better, things got worse. Thea Hein, the woman she attacked on the bus, would bring the issue to two of the area's fathers, Father Havinger and Father Roth. And when he met with Annalise, Father Havinger would consider her to be a normal and shy girl. At this point, Thea is starting to push people to do something about Annalise because she thought she was possessed. Because of this, a number of priests would become involved in the case, but we will highlight some of the more important ones. Father Rodwick from Frankfurt would come in next. He was considered an expert of demonic possession. He looked over what was going on and said that it seemed like there were some signs that she was in fact possessed. He was around 80 and stated that although he would absolutely love to help, he was a bit too old to do the exorcism himself and sent them to a Father Herman. She would describe the faces, but she was unable to use detail when asked to describe them with more detail. He wouldn't have any reactions that would lead him to believe that she was actually possessed despite what he was told. Father Roth, who was with Father Havinger when he first met with her, became very interested in figuring out what was going on. He discussed her case with another father, Father Alt, who also became interested in Annalise. Father Alt was interesting because although he was a priest, he believed in other types of paranormal activity. For example, he thought that he himself had ESP. Father Alt would write a letter to his bishop and he would then become involved in Annalise's case. He would try to tune his ESP to her energies and could sense energies radiating from her. He would claim that he saw no illnesses though. He would claim just holding letters from them could let him see all sorts of information about her family that he could not have known otherwise. He also would claim to experience the same smells and sleep paralysis that Annalise was experiencing. He would keep praying to Father Pio until his room smelled like violets, which was a smell that Father Pio would claim to smell when he was in his fits of religious ecstasy. I don't want to mock this stuff, so I should be really careful, but you certainly can't make this stuff up. I mean, they could have, I guess, but Anyhow, Father Roth would claim to smell the same smell as well. So there were a few people that would smell these smells, both the violets and the burning fecal matter smells, and who saw Annalise in one of these spells or fits where her face 
and eyes would change right in front of them and her hands too with the paws. The first time Father Alt would actually meet Annalise was in 1973 and he would describe her as pale and serious. She would tell him she was looking for people who would believe her. He would pray over her and after this he would say that her eyes darkened and it was almost as if she had left spiritually although she was still right there. She would smile, thank him, and tell him that she felt better. She would go on to go to school that fall and live in the dorms with a girl named Ursula who she knew from her grade school. Shortly into the year though, she would have a very hard time getting out of bed. After about a month and a half of not really getting out of bed, Ursula would persuade her to attend a dance and while at the dance, she met a boy named Peter. Peter would describe Annalise as captivating, animated, pretty, and just fun to talk to in general. Annalise would be confused as to why he was so captivated by her. She would attempt to push him away, but he really cared about her. On November 27th of 1973, Peter brought her to see Dr. Lenner, a psychologist. After meeting with her, he decided she was experiencing a neurosis brought on by her domineering parents. She would go to get another EEG and it showed a few irregular patterns. The neurologist performing this EEG would put her on a much stronger anticonvulsant. She would go back to father all this time with Peter and this time as he prayed over her, her face would change from worried and stressed to smooth and bright. And she would smile and say that she felt free. He would claim that this would happen most times after they prayed, her face would change and she would leave in a cheerful mood. Then in September of 1974, Thea Hine, the lady from the pilgrimage who Annalise attacked on the bus, persuaded Father Elt to write to the bishop demanding an exorcism for Annalise. Father Elt would at first say he didn't think it was necessary, but was concerned that her delicate nature did make her a target for demons. He would request to perform an exorcism and his request was denied. He would end up attempting to do the exorcism in his head because he didn't actually have permission. So the next time he saw her, he started praying the exorcism prayer in his head silently. And she actually reacted to it. She jolted and grabbed his rosary and ripped it up. In July of 1975, another one of her friends named Anna would come and visit her and she was sitting there with Annalise and Peter and she would claim that Annalise would contort her face into a grimace and her body would become stiff. Peter would say it was because she was possessed. So at this point, he really believed that she was. Her legs would also start to like tense up completely. She couldn't even bend at the knees and she would stop going to her masses. Father Roth came to visit the home after he talked with Father Al about the latest incident and as soon as he walked in, he could again smell that burning fecal matter and Annalise would charge at him and she would grab his rosary and fling it away. He had a crucifix in his pocket though, so watch out. He would reach for it, but before he could even pull it out, Annalise would grab a five gallon jug of San Damiano holy water and just smash it. Shortly after this, she would head to Killingburg for a relaxing Saturday drive with Peter. They would take a walk, but her legs were so stiff. She would drop to her knees and she wouldn't move or talk for about 10 minutes. And after those 10 minutes, she would leap up with joy and say that she had been visited by the Blessed Virgin Mary and that her legs weren't stiff anymore. And while there was no denying that, they rushed home to tell her parents and they were all very happy, of course. The next day they went to register for classes and they were out and about shopping and while they were standing in the store, her face would just drop and she would turn to him and as she did, her face would stiffen and she would just say, I think it's happening again. 
Can you imagine? And then she could barely move and it took them over an hour to walk back and when it took them only 10 minutes to get there. That's how bad her legs got in that short amount of time. And when they got back home, she just sat and fixated on a crucifix in the house, growling and gritting her teeth, unable to look away. He started to pray in his head and she would sneer stop through her clenched teeth. And when she came to, her explanation for her behavior was that she wanted to take the cross in her hands, but that she couldn't reach it against her will. At this point, Father Ross would write to Father All, and there was no question that she was possessed in their minds. So Father All wrote to the bishop to tell him, basically, he had another priest on board. So after Father All wrote this letter to the bishop, he got the green light to perform a minor exorcism. The bishop decided this based solely on Father All's letters. Father All and Father Roth started this minor exorcism on August 3rd of 1975. As they started to repeat the prayer, Annalise would beg them to stop, saying that it was burning and hurting her. She would say that it burned in her back and her arms, and then she tried to knock the prayer book out of Father All's hands. At one point, she would whisper she was free, then she would start whimpering again. And they left more convinced than ever that they were dealing with a possession. And unfortunately, she would only get worse from there. After this first exorcism, where usually Annalise seemed more sluggish and couldn't get out of bed because whatever was ailing her, it was like the opposite now. Like a switch had flipped and she would run around in a manic state, whereas before she was barely getting out of bed. And when I read this, it made me wonder if she had some sort of bipolar disorder mixed in here as well. If not demons, maybe a bipolar psychosis. Definitely would be on the extreme end if so, because she was also dropping to her knees and jumping back up until they were swollen and bleeding. Eventually, she would rupture her ligaments, but she would not stop jumping and dropping to her knees. She would stop eating because her neck muscles hurt so badly that she could barely even drink. And although she stopped eating food, at least, this didn't stop her from eating insects and any insects she could find alive. And she would drink her own urine, chew on coal or her dirty underwear. One time she bit the head off of a dead bird. She would urinate on the floor and lap it up like a cat. And one time they found her with her head in the toilet. She would hit, kick, or bite to the extent that her boyfriend Peter had to wear sweaters to hide all the marks from her outbursts. And one time she picked up one of her younger sisters and threw her against a wall. Her family would claim they would observe flies swarming her and stigmata, which stigmata is marks resembling Jesus's puncture wounds appearing on another person. And it's believed that people bearing stigmata were chosen by God to suffer similar wounds. Remember, Father Pio had some stigmata and her mother believed this means that Annalise died to atone for other souls and that it was a good thing. Other people saw them on her as well, though. She would have wounds on her hands and feet, but there's no indication that they were not self-inflicted. However, the way that they healed was way slower than her other wounds that she was constantly giving herself. And after they healed, she would claim that she could still feel them. I mean, some of this sounds like a severe medical problem, but the insects and the urine stuff, I mean, it could be severe psychological stuff, but I don't know. To me, it's hinting demon. I don't want to discredit the power of suggestion at this point either because everyone was telling her that she was possessed. What if she had epilepsy and then believed that she had demons because everyone told her that she had demons? I think it would strongly influence her behavior, but I also think that 
strongly hinting demon. Father Rodwick would come back on board after looking at that list of her most recent behaviors. She was laying flat on the kitchen floor when he came unresponsive and her father would pick her up and lay her down on their couch. She would wake up and attack her father, but Father Rodwick would restrain her. And when he asked her her name, she would respond Judas in a low male voice. Okay, so this stuff is insanely interesting to me, but apparently all demons have different things that they do. And apparently Judas is known for tempting the victims into stealing the host, but preventing them from swallowing it, which the host is referring to communion at church. And she would claim not to be able to swallow it one time, which was an indication that Judas was in fact in there they would actually have a normal conversation after this happened, at which point he told her parents that he did believe that she was possessed and he would be in touch about what they would do from there. As he was leaving though, Annalise ran up to him, slaps him in the face, then calmly walks over to her piano as if nothing had happened and just begins to play. She started eating after this as well, but it was literally the morning that her parents were talking about bringing her back to yet another doctor if she didn't start eating again. And that morning she would come downstairs like almost on cue right after this and either. So I guess she heard it or her demons heard it, right? I don't know, but she went and ate a massive breakfast and said that she had wanted to eat so many times, but she was being controlled. At this point, she wanted a major exorcism and other people did too. She had only been receiving minor ones up until now. The priests all met and felt that Judas giving his name when Father Rodwick met with her was sure proof that she was in fact possessed because Father Alt was closer to where she was going to school and this exorcism was going to happen closer to her hometown. They decided to have another priest not take Father Alt's place completely, but take more of a head position and they chose Father Renz he agreed to become involved. The first official major exorcism would begin on September 24th of 1975. They would all meet in a back upstairs room, put pictures of Mary, Jesus, and Father Pio out. A few people would come, her parents, her boyfriend, and two of her sisters, Father Alt, Father Roth, Father Herman, and the presiding priest, Father Renz. Thea Hine and her husband, Peter, would insert themselves as well. When they would begin, Father Renz would sprinkle some holy water on her and she would shake violently. She would rage and scream when he made the sign of the cross over her. Her father and Thea's husband, Peter, would have to hold her as she attempted to attack the priest. She would kick and bite at them. It would last for five and a half hours, after which Annalise would tell Father Renz that she was in fact present for the whole thing, but like in that space in her head where she could watch but not stop what was happening. She felt progress had been made, but she was also disappointed that it had not gone on for longer. She wasn't satisfied. And Father Renz was really disappointed that no demons had come out of her and even wrote in his journal that he was battling with feelings of failure and uselessness. Poor guy. Four days later, they would try again. Thea would bring a tape recorder and Father Renz would start recording the sessions because he found this way easier than taking notes. He ended up with 40 tapes altogether of these exorcisms. The next time, Judas would make another appearance and he would, for the most part, be the main speaker. He was followed by Lucifer himself, which, oh man, and there are arguments within um, the Catholic Church and Christianity as to if Lucifer actually does possess people, like, why would he? But, I mean, he's head demon, right? So if he wanted to for whatever reason, why couldn't he? I don't know. But after Lucifer would come Nero, Hitler, 
Kane and Pastor Fleshman. And Pastor Freshman was a fallen priest from the parish that Father Alt had just become in charge of. And he had even told Annalise about this priest. He was a drunk womanizer who beat a man to death in a parish house and a woman to within an inch of her life. And Father Alt did share the story with Annalise. He would later claim that she would tell him details that he had never told her and some that he didn't even know himself. So apparently this parish house was also haunted by Pastor Fleshman and Annalise would claim that Pastor Fleshman was the black one and he would torture her with his fists. The demons would say, <coughs> yeah, right? <coughs> yeah. Demon talk. Dogs don't like demons. <coughs> That's known. <laughs> Anyhow, the demons would say she was damned for eternity. They would speak to each other and the people who were watching the exorcisms. Judas would say that Hitler had a big mouth but not much to say. Each demon would have a different voice, down to Hitler even, where people would say that she spoke in his dialect. The demons would say they gained entry to Annalise because a jealous woman who lived next to her mother Anna had cursed her before she was even born. Anna would even claim that she knew who the demons were referring to. Apparently, she had lived near a woman during the war who was a refugee and was resentful when Anna married her husband and they started to do well in life. They did try to locate this woman after what was said, but she had already passed away. They would tell Father Renz to give up that she belonged to them and to get out of here with his shit words. Poor guy. They would even tell him that not even sows would eat him. They would comment that people don't believe in the church and the Immaculate Conception, something that they have been very hard at work with. They would react to holy water and only holy water. It was taking a lot of energy out of Annalise every time they performed an exorcism. Father Havinger was worried and expressed his concern to the expert, Father Roderick. He was worried she couldn't take any more and was concerned that the demons would actually kill her. Father Roderick said demons couldn't actually kill a person. Father Roderick addressed them saying they need to leave her alone because she couldn't endure this for much longer, both physically and spiritually. Judas would respond to this and say that she must bear it a little longer because she is cursed and that he was near her or she would have already hung herself and apparently that he was referring to was some sort of guardian angel. Regarding her appetite, she would say it was not good and her demons were not allowing her to eat. She was having an extremely hard time keeping up with school, which she was still trying to do during this time and her demons would even take credit for this, saying they would blow in her ears when she was trying to study and whisper that she was damned. They would also take credit for all of the illnesses that she had experienced over the course of her life. So her friends who would visit her after all of this would be shocked by how she looked. She was barely responsive even, severely underweight and just laying in bed, people were extremely worried. They were wondering at this point if the family was preventing Annalise from seeing a doctor. By the time it was time to turn in her senior thesis, she was unable to do it. She made it this far, but she was succumbing to whatever it was that was ailing her. So the head of her college wanted an explanation as to why she wouldn't be able to finish her work. He decided that she wouldn't be able to get an extension without a doctor's explanation. 
which I guess is fair. And she would wake up screaming one morning and after Father Alt would come and he would end up speaking to the head of the school for her instead of a doctor. And because it was a religious college, they accepted the explanation, the demon possession, and they let her live off campus on the parish to get whatever exorcisms that she needed while she finished her studies. But while she was on the way there, she felt that Mary and her demons were telling her that this arrangement wouldn't last for long. In fact, they were telling her that it would be done and she would be free in July. When they arrived, Annalise went to see the newly remodeled church, but when she went in, her face would contort again and she would tell Peter that she would have to stay there until the evening mass and pray, which was a few hours away still. And he tried to lift her, but she was too heavy for him. So he got Father Alt to pray over her. And after that, they were able to get her to bed. And she remained there for days, either on the bed or on the floor by her bed. On May 9th, she went home and she got even worse. She had to be constantly restrained and it was as if she was always being pushed to the ground almost by an unseen force. And her strength was almost superhuman at the same time. The college would call her and inform her parents that she missed her deadline to turn in the thesis and she had a student teaching position lined up for her in September that she wasn't going to be able to do at this point if she didn't get her thesis in with a doctor's note. So her family doctor agreed to do a house call which they canceled when Father Alt was able to get some sort of doctor's note from a doctor he knew and this granted her an extension and with this news her condition seemed to improve again and she had this six hour window of peace where she was able to draft her outline for her thesis that peter and her sister ultimately would end up using to type up the rest of the thesis and turn it in for her father Renz would write to the bishop and he would describe annalise's injuries they would bring a medical doctor in that June because of how frail she had become and this doctor would be questioned in the trial that would happen after everything was said and done and his story would change. The doctor would come and see her although he would deny that in court. He would exclaim that she had the stigmata and that no form of medicine that he had would be able to help her. He would exclaim there is no injection against the devil. June 8th of 1976 was the last day that Father Elt would see Annalise alive. She was looking worse than ever and he would check in with the family to try and see if she was eating and she wasn't. June 30th was her last exorcism session. She had a fever and the last words that she would say to Father Renz was, please, absolution. After everyone left, she would ask her mom to stay with her and told her that she was afraid. And her mom would sit with her until she fell asleep. The next morning, her father would go to check on her and he would feel pleased at first to see that she was sleeping peacefully, except that she wasn't. She passed away that first day of July, just as the demons and the Blessed Mary had told her. She was only 23 years old and 68 pounds, and her official cause of death was starvation and dehydration. Annalise was exhumed on February 25th of 1978 to check for signs of decomposition, and she had been decomposed. The fathers would question this because they themselves didn't get to see the body, and apparently if she had not decomposed, she would have been considered to be a saint. She was reburied next to her family's home. Annalise's parents, Father Alt and Father Renz, were all charged with negligent homicide. Before the trial, Joseph would request prayer because it was a case of possession, and the judge would deny this. Rosita, one of Annalise's sisters, was put on the stand, and when asked why she didn't call the doctor, she would say, why? They can't do anything for possession. Peter and Thea Hine were put on the stand as well. 
One of her doctors would testify that she had epilepsy, but she may have also suffered from delusional thoughts about being too sinful, which is common among religious people who were suffering from depression as well. He believed that the medication that she was taking was stopping her seizures, but that the epilepsy had developed into a psychosis, which had spiraled into a mental illness that the people around her fed into. In this case, people validating her would have fueled her delusion. Both Father Renz and Father Alt were seen by a psychologist who deemed that Father Renz didn't have any signs of psychosis himself, but that Father Alt was exhibiting signs of schizophrenia. All four were found guilty of negligent homicide. The judge did say that he believed that none of them could have known that Annalise's epilepsy would have evolved into a psychosis. He thought that she should have been committed although this would have been completely against her wishes. They were all given a six month sentence that was suspended and they were given three years of probation instead and the priests each had some fines to pay as well. The judge decided that everybody had really suffered enough. So what happened? I think it's important to restate that visual hallucinations are often symptomatic of both epilepsy and psychosis. That being said, Annalise's case shows indication that she could be suffering from epilepsy and any variety of psychotic disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or even disassociative identity disorder, or that multiple personalities is what they used to call it. And her being in that back room kind of shows that. Or depression and religious psychosis. There's that shared delusion, folie a deux, trois, or however many were involved in this madness. Or was she truly possessed? I think it's interesting because really it could have been any one or any combination of these afflictions. I think uh, the exorcism coming out in 1973 could have really been a factor as well. What do you guys think? I am going to play a clip of the audio that I could find just to show you how disturbing her voice sounds during these exorcisms and I will warn you I don't know how this stuff works. <laughs> I don't. Uh, so you may actually be hearing a demon. Uh, so if you don't want to, maybe shut your volume off for 20 seconds. And with that, let's give it a listen. <laughs> I just think there's too much here that says demon. 
1999, the official exorcism guidebook was revised partially because of this case. Speaking in tongues, physical strength, and aversion to unholy objects are still listed as signs of possession. However, now it is noted that these are all signs of mental illnesses as well, and that these need to be ruled out first. There is never an instantaneous change in a person after a long-term possession and penance is considered more powerful than an exorcism and should be done first, but in some extreme cases, they may need an exorcism to get themselves there. All right, I told you guys this was going to be a long one and well, here we are. But as always, let's try to end today on a more positive note. I don't know that case is just so sad and bad, no matter what angle you look at it from, but Thanksgiving is right around the corner here in the States. And I know I've been reflecting a lot myself lately about the things that I am thankful for. I can't wait to pound down as much mashed potatoes and gravy as I can handle. Um, but yeah, let's bring back Scoot Dog over here for another harsh truth. Hi, Scoot. Got some bacon! Bacon! <laughs> Let's go! We got a good one today. Alright. This week's harsh truth is simple. If you're threatening bad things, eating bugs, peeing on the floor, or just plain dropping on the ground, rolling around like you are possessed, time to get help. I don't know if you need an exorcism a therapist or a straitjacket, but get the help that you need. I wish I had been kidding, but alas, this is a week of giving thanks and I'm thankful for Scooter. <laughs> he makes everything more positive. Actually guys, I did read the sounds that I played affected dogs of listeners. So let's test that out real quick. And I hope this isn't really a mistake, but we're gonna try it. All right, the scooter, we're gonna have you weigh in on demons. Ready? I guess if it looks and sounds and acts like a demon, it might be a demon. Maybe not. But trust the animals, especially the dogs. I hear they can tell. Maybe not this one. <laughs> but they don't, they're not supposed to like demons either. And to all the nonprofits and people out there who are working extra hard during this time of year to give back to the people who are as fortunate. Thank you as well. We need more good people in this cruel world. All right, guys, I'll be back with a Thanksgiving story next week. I hope you all have a fantastic Thanksgiving and stay thankful, stay grateful. Please subscribe to this channel if you like today's story. I don't know how many more like it I will do, but I do have this video where demons were kind of a factor or said to be, you know, same deal. Check it out if you're interested, and until next time, please stay safe out there. Bye!